Καλησπέρα σας και καλώς ήρθατε. Good evening and welcome again. Um, tonight's um, seminar is, um, is sponsored by Mrs. Evstratia Papadopoulou. Is she here? No. Anyway, uh, we thank her very much. Um, if you would like to donate or sponsor a lecture of your choice, you can do that um, after the lecture. Uh, see me or Dimitra at the back. Um, also, we have some books for sale. There are um, different books, some are novels, very nice, both in English and in Greek. Now, um, tonight's, um, tonight, Dr. Roslyn Bell will talk about Alexander in art. And by Alexander, we mean Alexander the Great, of course. Um, let's um, have a few words about um, Dr. Bell. Dr. Roslyn Bell is currently an associate um, research fellow in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies at the University of Melbourne. Before this, she taught a range of courses in Greek and Roman art and archaeology. Her research is largely in the field of Roman art and the topography of ancient Rome, and she also has a great love of Greek art. Now, in this, um, it, tonight, Dr. Roslyn Bell will talk about the evolution of Alexander's image from the Hellenistic and Roman times uh, to his later transformations in the medieval Alexander romance and the artistic traditions of Persia and Iran. I thought Persia and Iran are the same countries. Okay. All right. Would love to hear anything you say. Let's welcome Dr. Roslyn Bell. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and of course for the invitation to speak uh, tonight. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, so as you've heard, my focus, uh, the focus of my research uh, tends mostly to be ancient Rome. So I speak to you, and this is important tonight, not as a self-proclaimed expert on Alexander uh, by any means, but rather like you all, I think, as an Alexander enthusiast, um, shall we say, and most particularly an admirer of uh, the art and the monuments in which he appears. And one of the themes that interests me in ancient art as a whole, are the ways in which prominent individuals uh, in antiquity, be they kings, politicians, emperors, uh, use visual imagery uh, for propagandist purposes. So this is really what I'm interested in. Uh, so they use it as a, uh, as a means to convey perhaps a sense of their own character, or at least how they'd like their character to be perceived. Um, but also their ambitions and their accomplishments. Uh, and this is important to remember, uh, that remem in antiquity, rates of illiteracy were very, very high. Uh, so if you want to get a message across to your people, uh, most of the populace were far more likely to see your face on a coin or an honorific statue in a public square than they were ever to read your proclamations or the histories um, of, your, uh, of your exploits or any sort of official texts. And when you think about it, uh, the use of visual propaganda is something that we in the modern world uh, can relate to, I think, very easily uh, and often take entirely for granted. Uh, and it's no less important uh, today for people in power to present themselves in the right way, to give the right image to the people uh, than it was 2,000 years ago. Uh, so a case in point, and I almost didn't, I didn't, I almost didn't include this slide because it is entirely ridiculous. So please do, uh, do forgive me for it. But I'm sure we can all remember uh, the furor that erupted, um, that made it all of the way to the BBC, to the Washington Post, all of the way around the world, just prior to this, to um, the general election, when it was revealed that the, an official family portrait on Scott Morrison's website uh, had been photoshopped to take out his grubby sneakers 
and replace them with clean ones. Now, it's, it's a ridiculous example, I know, um, but it just shows you how important presenting the right image is. And I'm not sure whether the photoshopper here uh, was trying to make a subversive political statement, but he actually gave the Prime Minister two left feet, but I don't know, perhaps that's just, that's just uh, you know, appalling photoshopping on his part. Uh, but so just, anyway, let's move away from that. But just another couple of examples that perhaps have a little bit more gravitas, shall we say, from the 20th century, of course, Joseph Stalin at the helm of the Soviet state in the 1930s in this propaganda poster, and Winston Churchill in his official portrait from 1944. So the quintessential statesman looking somber and pugnacious and resolute. And of course, more recently, uh, Vladimir Putin uh, perhaps <laughs> is the best known exponent of visual propaganda. So. At the top, you can see, just casually posed, uh, having discovered two ancient transport amphorae while diving in the Black Sea in 2011, as you do. Uh, and at the bottom, clearly in what he, uh, what he thinks is the embodiment of sort of Russian machismo, uh, shirtless riding a horse while on holiday in southern Siberia. Actually, here, he is borrowing... Uh, an equestrian type of ruler portrait that goes back to antiquity, and in fact to Alexander the Great, uh, as we'll see a little bit later. But today, in this age of internet communications, the veracity or integrity of an image can easily be challenged and it can be manipulated. So for example, it was correctly revealed in 2011 uh, that the whole diving incident was, was staged and archaeologists, not surprisingly, had planted the amphorae in the shallow water just so Putin could find them. And of course, as we all know, no self-respecting person who loves antiquities would ever hold a vessel by its ancient handles. That, this, just the thought of that gives me shivers. That's just, <laughs> that's just bad on so, so many levels. Uh, so they can be manipulated as well, and we really don't want to go there. Uh, to the extent that they have the opposite effect, of course, of what was originally intended. But again, that's an image that none of us need in our brains. Uh, anyway. So it's clear, my point is, uh, that like leaders today, Alexander the Great cared deeply about the way in which his likeness was recorded and was conveyed. And unlike modern day politicians, he had total control of his public image during his lifetime. And it's no coincidence that the Macedonian royal family were great patrons of the arts. So this ensured, of course, that when it came to crafting his own public image, Alexander had the best talent uh, to call upon. Uh, so we know, for example, that he had a court sculptor, Lysippus. He had a court painter, Apalles, uh, both of whom we'll hear a little bit more about in a minute. He even had a court gem cutter, Pregotiles, um, about whom little is known. Uh, Pliny tells us that he was the only artist allowed to engrave seal rings, so the means by which Alexander sealed his official correspondence. He's also likely to have been uh, responsible for cutting the dyes, of course, for minting coins. Uh, so it's ironic, though, uh, that despite having all of the court artists working in multiple media at his beck and call, and despite the survival uh, of a large number of portraits of Alexander from antiquity, the true appearance of the historical Alexander in many ways is just as hard to pin down as his true character and his temperament. So we know, of course, we all know that ancient and modern historians paint vastly different pictures of Alexander the man as a heroic adventurer, as a military genius, as a visionary, as a murderous bully, as a megalomaniac. Uh, likewise, the images we have of him uh, surviving from antiquity depict him in very different ways also. And we have to remember that just like our literary sources on Alexander, by far the majority of the images that we have of him aren't contemporary, so not created during his lifetime, rather decades, sometimes even centuries after his death. So some ostensibly come from copies of the original works created during his lifetime, others are clearly creations of an artist's imagination. So we'll have a look at all of these uh, tonight. So uh, the aim tonight then is to briefly, and probably I've got far more to say than I should do, so just once you all start looking desperately bored, I shall stop. Um, but we'll attempt to briefly trace the evolution of Alexander's image, starting with the very few representations that can, with varying degrees of certainty, uh, be identified as images created during his lifetime. <laughs> 
Uh, then we'll move on to those made in the decades and centuries after Alexander's death by men who are seeking to, to capitalize on their connections to Alexander. And then finally, we'll end up with some of my favorites, the fabulous later works uh, that are created as memories of the historical Alexander fade and as Alexander the divine mythic uh, hero is born. So to begin, um, with the representation that's been described as the one image that Alexander would definitely have seen in his lifetime, uh, although of course we have no way of knowing that, so we can't know for sure, but of course it is, and I'm sure you will all recognize it, uh, the fresco on the stunning tomb at Vergina, uh, which is identified, but not without some dissent, uh, as the tomb of Alexander's father, of course, Philip II of Macedon. So we're looking, of course, at this wonderful painted frieze above this one, this uh, Doric uh, columns and tablature. The problem is, unfortunately, uh, the painted frieze itself, as you can see, is very poorly uh, preserved, so I've just included an artist's reconstruction here for you as well. So what do, we, what do we see? It's clearly a frieze of men out hunting. Some are naked, some are clothed, some are on foot, uh, some are on horseback. But I think amongst the melee of figures, uh, two stand out. Uh, a figure on horseback in the center of the composition, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and to his right, uh, a middle-aged bearded man um, on a rearing horse about to spear a lion, as you can see. So it's difficult to make out the details, unfortunately, in the reconstruction, so I'll just show you a detail of his face. So you can see a bearded, middle-aged individual on a horse with a, uh, holding a spear. Much is made of the fact uh, that this particular figure is shown from his left-hand side. So we see the left-hand side of his face. Of course, we know that Philip uh, lost his right eye uh, in battle. And in fact, one of the arguments for identifying this tomb as that of uh, Philip's tomb is that the skeletal remains inside are consistent with someone who received battle wounds to his eye and his legs. So that's one of the arguments anyway. Uh, so the orientation here of the figure is important. It's argued that, of course, we're seeing his good side and he's hiding uh, the damaged right side of his face. So, of course, if this is Philip, uh, then it stands to reason that the other main figure uh, will be his son, Alexander. Like Philip, he's on a rearing horse, and this is what begins this famous series of equestrian representations of Alexander uh, that we've already alluded to. It's not clear what animal he's uh, spearing. You can just see the reconstruction there. Uh, possibly he wears a wreath that would indicate his royal status. Uh, beyond this, there's not much, I think, that we can say about the appearance of Alexander the man, apart from the fact that he's represented beardless to, uh, to indicate perhaps a more youthful figure. And in doing this, Alexander sparks a new trend in portraits of rulers that lasts for 500 years, up until the reign of the Roman Emperor Hadrian, who reverts back to wearing a beard. So this is, you know, this is important. So he contrasts, but perhaps deliberately or consciously, with his father, who was always represented as a mature uh, bearded man. So Philip opting for the tradition that goes back to classical Greece, this idea of maturity, M mature men have beards, possibly an imitation of the god Zeus, whereas uh, Alexander is starting a new fashion, a preference for an Apollo-like image. And I just, a couple of statues, Zeus possibly, possibly Poseidon on the left-hand side and Apollo on the right. So you can see the difference in what we're talking about. Uh, Apollo, a god on the cusp of manhood with a full athletic body, he's clean shaven and he has short hair. So this is the, these are the illusions uh, that Alexander is drawing on. And we can see the same kind of contrast uh, in these two small ivory heads that are found within uh, Philip's tomb. These are two of a dozen or so heads uh, believed to have been uh, the decorative appliques on the tomb's funerary couch. Unfortunately, of course, the couch itself is made of organic material, so we've lost that, but what remains are these fabulous ivory decorations. <clears throat> so these two small heads, just over three centimeters high. So incredible detail for these tiny, tiny figures. So the first figure, you can see a, a mature, bearded, kind of careworn uh, figure, possibly with a scar running through his eye. People have made much of that, uh, of course, uh, as well. The second figure, as you can see, a, a more youthful figure with his head turned, his gaze uh, slightly lifted and clean shaven. So of course, identified as Alexander. <clears throat> 
So if the Virginia heads do represent Philip and Alexander, then it clearly shows the royal family's interest, I think, in creating royal imagery for propaganda purposes. Uh, and here, I think, perhaps to emphasize the continuity of the, of the dynasty. Uh, <clears throat> if we want to get a true idea, though, of the royal image of Alexander, however, we need to look no further uh, than the work of what, the one man largely responsible uh, for the creation of Alexander's official image, uh, and that is Lysippus of Sicyon. So Lysippus was one of the fourth century's greatest sculptors from Sicyon in the northern Peloponnese. Uh, we have a number of his most famous works surviving in Roman copies, so no originals surviving, but the Romans are great copyists, of course, of Greek sculpture, and thankfully we have these surviving at least. Uh, so his two most famous works uh, from antiquity, uh, Eros stringing his bow and the Apoxiomenos, um, the athlete, scraping himself off uh, with a strigil. By far the most important commission, though, that Lysippus undertook during his long career was the portrait of Alexander the Great. Uh, and according to the historian Plutarch in his Life of Alexander, he tells us that the outward appearance of Alexander is best represented by the statues of him which Lysippus made. And it was by that, uh, this artist alone that Alexander himself thought it fit that he should be modeled. So Lysippus or bust. Uh, in other words, uh, Alexander considered Lysippus the only, court, the only sculptor worthy of representing him, and so Lysippus' image becomes the official image of Alexander. And characteristic of Lysippus' work uh, is the representation uh, of him with the distinctive poise and turn of the neck, so bent slightly to the right, uh, and the melting glance of his eyes. Unfortunately, as is often the case, uh, the bronze original that Lysippus creates has been lost to us. So again, the image only survives to us in Roman sculptures. And in this case, the best work uh, is a statue known as the Azara Herm. Uh, a Herm, of course, uh, is a portrait normally placed on a rectangular pillar, as you can see here. Usually the face is that of Hermes, hence the, uh, hence the name. But in this case, it's clearly labelled Alexander, uh, son of Philip. So the identity of the individual uh, is in no doubt. Unfortunately, as you can also see, the surface of the work is quite badly damaged. Uh, but it's clear, however, that it demonstrates certain, certainly the characteristics of the Lysippan type. So the turn of the head, and this will become more and more pronounced in subsequent works, quite prominent eyes, uh, his gaze, I don't know, not particularly melting, I would say, but remember, marble sculptures in antiquity would have been painted, so that would have added extra life uh, to the figure. The original in bronze would have had eyes inlaid with mother or pearl or with ivory, again, uh, adding extra uh, life also to the figure. Uh, note that he doesn't meet the viewer's gaze, uh, rather his eyes are sort of focused, like mine are, because my, I mean, I can't see you out of focus, but sort of off in the distance uh, as if he's sort of occupied with, with higher thoughts, uh, if you like. And in fact, um, Plutarch tells us that Alexander would stand at gazing upwards towards the sky and that Lysippus' sculpture captured this so well that someone inscribed the epigram, the bronze statue seems to proclaim, looking at Zeus, I place the earth under my sway. You, O oh Zeus, you can keep Olympus. So really embodying at the breadth of Alexander's vision and the grandeur of his ambitions and his accomplishments. Uh, the other characteristic features which get picked up and exaggerated by other sculptors here is this luxuriant head of hair. Alexander always has plenty of curls uh, and a really sort of vibrant uh, look to his face. It adds a sort of a sense of vitality or energy to the figure, kind of windblown look to suggest that he's always outdoors engaged in, in energetic activity. Uh, also very characteristic of portraits of Alexander is what we call the anastole. The anastole are these central strands of hair in the middle of the forehead that stand upright. So that's very characteristic of Alexander. Uh, also a firm jaw, reasonably thin aristocratic features, uh, a long, thin, classicizing nose, of course, uh, and his mouth being just slightly open, uh, creating a sense of animation as if the figure is taking a, uh, taking a breath. So exactly how close to what Alexander actually looked like 
uh, this is we can only guess. Uh, Lysippus himself, we're told, liked to make things as they seemed rather than as they were. So subtle difference there. So he's capturing perhaps the, the ethos, the spirit of the conqueror, uh, his arete, his admirable virtues perhaps. Uh, where the Azara Herm is only a copy of a Greek original, we do have one sculpture that could well be an original uh, from Alexander's time, uh, if not his own lifetime, then produced soon after his death. Uh, this is, uh, and it's attributed by some uh, to Lysippus himself, a Greek original found in a shrine in Sparta. Uh, the head probably belonged to a full-bodied statue, which has subsequently been lost, unfortunately, and we see quite clearly its most striking feature is that Alexander is represented here in the guise of Heracles with the lion skin uh, on his head. And this is exactly the image that Alexander puts on his coins. So uh, this is a nice example of a tetradrachm uh, minted in Babylon during Alexander's reign. And it's important to realize that it's not yet the done thing during Alexander's lifetime to put your own face on coins. Nobody has done that. You don't put your own face on coins. Rather, you put the deity or the hero uh, whom your, yourself or your city claims a particularly close connection. So your patron, uh, if you like. And in this case, uh, Alexander is claiming the patronage of Heracles. And if the features of Heracles just happen to bear a striking resemblance to Alexander, uh, then that, of course, is entirely purely uh, coincidence. But the motif of Heracles and the lion recurs throughout the imagery of Alexander. So there are plenty of reasons why he would have wanted to cultivate uh, this association. So firstly, Heracles, apart, of course, from his renown. Uh, for accomplishing almost impossible feats and acts of strength and bravery, is a Panhellenic hero. So he Heracles appeals to all of the Greek peoples as well as to the Macedonians. Uh, more importantly, he's the hero uh, from whom the Macedonian royal family claims descent. And through Heracles, of course, they could trace their lineage all of the way back to Zeus himself. And usually, on the reverse of these coins, you find, just to hammer that point home, the cult statue of Zeus from uh, the great temple at uh, Olympia. So making that connection explicit. Uh, it's interesting if we compare the two works uh, to speculate on the age of Alexand uh, Alexander in these representations. Of course, we don't get Alexander aging uh, in his works as we do many other fourth century rulers. Uh, of course, he dies before his 33rd 33rd birthday, so he's not going to, he's always going to retain these sort of youthful uh, qualities. We do get a little bit of variation though. Um, you might argue possibly that the Herm is a little bit more mature uh, of a figure. Um, there are some lines, I don't know if you can see them, but very vague lines on his forehead as if he's just slightly more careworn. Um, the face lacking perhaps the fleshiness of youth uh, that the head does over here. But uh, beyond that, there's not much we can say, I think. Um, another work, though, that contributes to our overall picture of Alexander uh, is the work that we began a detail uh, with, the Alexander Sarcophagus. Now, the name is misleading. Of course, this is not Alexander's sarcophagus. Unfortunately, that has yet to be found, maybe sometime in the future. Uh, rather, what we're looking at here is a painted sarcophagus uh, found in 1877 in the Royal Cemetery at Sidon, so uh, an area now in modern Lebanon. And the sarcophagus belonged to King Abdalonimus of Sidon. So Abdalonimus was a local satrap, a governor, installed on the throne in the area by Alexander after the Battle of Issus in 333 BCE, and he ruled until his death in 311. So the, the sarcophagus is probably commissioned and completed while Abdalonimus is still alive. So I think we can be fairly certain that he personally had an, in, had an input in choosing the subjects uh, represented in these magnificent sculptural panels uh, that appear on each side. Uh, so uh, what you can see here quite clearly uh, is a battle scene devoted to Alexander in battle. So here he is fighting the Persians. And you can always recognize Persians uh, because they wear trousers. Of course, no self-respecting Greek would be caught dead wearing trousers. This is the mark of a barbarian. So trousers and these soft kind of floppy Phrygian hats. Those of you who know what Smurfs look like, they're kind of a Smurfy hat. Um, 
So the scene uh, possibly comes from a lost sculptural, a, a copy of a lost sculptural group commemorating Alexander's famous victory at Granicus. Uh, and this explains why Alexander, uh, whom you see here, is riding in from the left, because Alexander, of course, always uh, commanded the, the, the flanking charges of the cavalry. Uh, but he also did this at Issus, so um, the iconography is debated. Uh, but the fact that he's, uh, that he's shown at the side there I think very nicely singles him out from this other, you know, the melee of figures uh, in the rest of the scene. And he's immediately identifiable because, of course, here he is on his rearing horse with uh, the uh, lion skin of Heracles on his head. So just hammering home his invincibility, the fact that he's favoured by the gods, representing him as Heracles. And it's the same sort of equestrian type, again, that we saw on Philip II's tomb fresco. It's an image that's largely synonymous with bravery and with strength and victory. Uh, and you can see the horse rears as he's about to plunge a spear. We have to imagine that there would have been a bronze spear in his hand that's been lost. But you can see, I'm not sure where it was plunging into the Persian uh, to the side. Uh, so, not surprisingly, we also see Alexander on the other side of the sarcophagus as well. Uh, uh, this is a, a scene, again, that we've already seen on the tomb uh, of Philip, a lion hunt. And it's the type of scene that was clearly popular with Macedonian royalty. Uh, and in fact, uh, the lion hunt is used as a means of representing heroism and battle skills uh, for Near Eastern rulers uh, since 3000 BCE. So it, is an it has an extremely long tradition that Alexander and his contemporaries here are obviously tapping into. And in Macedonian art in the fourth century BC, it becomes a standard scene that's associated with royalty. Whether or not they actually took part in lion hunts, um, obviously it's something that the king is expected and to be seen to be doing. Uh, and in this case, possibly a reflection of reality. We know that the Persians had enclosed game parks for hunting, for example. Uh, we also know from sources that Alexander's friend Craterus set up a sculptural dedication at Delphi, which commemorated a particular lion hunt in which Craterus himself saved Alexander's life. So you can see why Craterus wants to commemorate that in a very public way. Uh, and this sculptural group might uh, be reflected in this mosaic that we get from the Macedonian capital in Pala uh, that represents uh, Alexander uh, locked in combat with a lion and you can see perhaps maybe his foot here has just been trapped by the paw of the lion and here of course is Craterus uh, coming to his uh, aid. Uh, the sculptors of the monument at Delphi, the original monument at Delphi, included Lysippus himself so you can see kind of all of these threads weaving together. Uh, but again, Alexander is off to the side. If we look at our sarcophagus again, uh, again, one of the interesting things to note, not surprisingly perhaps, is that actually the main figure on the sarcophagus isn't Alexander, but this central figure dressed typically in this Eastern fashion. Again, this, uh, this must be Abdelonymus himself, the man whose sarcophagus uh, it actually is. Uh, and note his, similar, his very similar position to Alexander on the other side of the sarcophagus. So he's deliberately drawing a connection between himself and Alexander in the same pose. Um, on either side of, of Abdelonymus are two very distinctly Greek looking figures. So here we have one to his other side, obviously Alexander himself in this very heroic, typical classicizing uh, way on the rearing horse with his cloak billowing out behind him. I mean, this is a motif that we can trace back to the Parthenon uh, frieze, for example, those wonderful horsemen on the Parthenon frieze, cloaks billowing behind them. You can see that he originally would have worn a metal diadem there just to pick him out uh, from all of the other figures as well. And on the other side of Abdelonymus, uh, a figure seen from the back, again short here, maybe Alexander's closest companion, uh, Hephaestion. So we've got Abdelonymus on his sarcophagus attempting to enhance his own status by showing himself engaging not only in the sport of kings, but doing so in the company of the greatest conqueror uh, the world had ever seen. So that's the Alexander sarcophagus. Uh, one other famous artwork uh, which utilizes this equestrian type of Alexander and which may give some indication of the actual appearance of the man uh, is this wonderful uh, mosaic uh, 
that shows, I think, the universal appeal of, of Alexander uh, during the Hellenistic period. Probably the most famous image of all of Alexander. Of course, it's the mosaic floor from the House of the Fawn at Pompeii. So you can see, if you visit the House of the Fawn today, what you'll see in situ is a copy. If you want to see the original mosaic, and of course, it's in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. But originally, in the reception area, the pride of place of this magnificent house, where all visitors to the house would have seen it quite clearly. It's a showpiece, without a doubt. So this mosaic dates to the late second, early first century BCE. Uh, and we might ask how a mosaic produced centuries after Alexander's death might provide a clue uh, as to what the man actually looked like. Uh, the reason is that this scene is almost certainly not an invention of the Roman mosaicist. Rather, it's thought to be a copy of a monumental wall painting done for Cassander, one of Alexander the Great's generals and one of his successors uh, in the last quarter of the fourth century BCE. So here, this, this famous painting has been translated into mosaic with small colored tesserae, so tiny, tiny pieces of colored glass and colored stone, all two to three millimeters in size. There are over a million of them in this mosaic. And it's so detailed, the technique is called opus vermiculatum, worm work, as if kind of just a worm has left trails uh, across the pavement, so detailed. Uh, so the iconography, uh, the scene represents one of Alexander's great battles against the Persian king Darius. Uh, scholars are divided between either the Battle of Issus or the Battle of Galgamela. We could spend a whole lecture on this debate, we won't. Um, most scholars prefer Issus, uh, but we really don't have enough information to prove one or the other. But what you do see, however, is the very is very dramatic either way. So from the left-hand side here is Alexander. Here, of course, you have Alexander and the Macedonian cavalry sweeping in, uh, going for the center of power. The Persian ranks here, Darius in his chariot, uh, in pretty much the center of the composition. Uh, you can see that quite clearly Darius is realizing that the tide of the battle is turning against him. He is reaching out in despair. We can just, here he is here, uh, reaching out in despair as Alexander impales one of his bodyguards. So here in front of him. All of his companions are falling under the onslaught of the Macedonians, and the charioteer is in the process of, you can see he's got his whip in his hand, uh, turning the chariot round so Darius can flee uh, the battlefield and make his escape. Here is a detail you can see of Darius. Uh, the incredible painterly quality to this mosaic, um, and also it's, it's just full of so many wonderful details. Look at this, for example, uh, the face of a fallen Persian soldier reflected in the inside of his shield and the expression on his face as he realizes he's about to be trampled under the hooves of the Macedonian uh, cavalry. Also, incredible detail, uh, the gradation of tone. Sorry, this is the art historian in me coming out, but it, it's, it's the painterly qualities. Remember, tiny little bits of glass and stone here, and the skill of foreshortening, exemplified by this magnificent view of a horse's ass. It just doesn't get any better than that when it comes to foreshortening. But extraordinary detail in terms of the weaponry and also the costumes uh, that the figures in this painting, uh, in this mosaic, uh, are wearing as well. Uh, so, it's extraordinary. Uh, the fact that the original painter has obviously striven, I think, for so much accuracy suggests that he had first-hand knowledge of Alexander and his campaigns. And I think it's well within the realms of possibility that the original uh, painting, that the original painter actually knew, perhaps traveled uh, with Alexander before undertaking this commission for uh, Cassander. And for this reason, uh, it's been suggested that this may be as close to knowing what the real Alexander looked like as we're ever probably going uh, to get. And I think that you can see certainly some uh, similarities to the, to the supposed type sculpted by Lysippus. Relatively long, uh, wind blown here. Perhaps the suggestion of the anastole at the front of the forehead. Large eyes, thin aristocratic nose, uh, small lips, a little bit like the Azara Hymn, clean shaven, of course, very important. Although some nice sideburns, as if he sort of, you know, with, with, with the ferociousness of battle and everything that he has to do, he hasn't quite had time for a, uh, for a good shave. 
Another inter interesting, I think, facet of this portrait are, are the interpretations of Alexander's character that are made by scholars based on this particular image. Um, I was fortunate to attend a lecture in New Zealand uh, by the formidable scholar uh, Ernst Badian on this subject shortly before his death. Uh, Badian is, uh, was one of the most prominent scholars of ancient history of his generation, if not of the 20th century. And I'm not biased in this assessment, even though I'm an alumna of his university uh, in New Zealand, where he was famously the acting head of department while still an undergraduate student. So that says something a little bit about Badian's character. Um, but Badian is one of the old school of 20th century scholars whose opinions on Alexander tended to be quite polarized. So either they consider him to be a visionary leader uh, with utopian ideals about the unification of mankind and the equality of all races, uh, or they see him as a drunken, psychotic, mass murdering megalomaniac. Um, I should point out today, of course, that scholars tend to take a much more balanced uh, view of Alexander's personality and career. Uh, Badian, however, was very much in the megalomaniac uh, school of thought. For him, there was little to choose uh, between Alexander and Hitler. But this is, of course, influenced by Badian's own life as a Jew growing up in Germany during the Third Reich. So you can't help but be informed by your, uh, by your own life and experiences. Uh, anyway. In the lecture, uh, Badian told us that he saw in this image uh, Alexander the madman, hideously ugly with a glint of lunacy in his eye. Um, beauty, of course, or madness is in the eye of the beholder. I leave you to draw your own conclusions. I would venture to say that I see none of this uh, in this particular image. Of course, I never told Badian that. He was a scary man. Um, but draw your own uh, interpretations. Anyway, uh, the Alexander mosaic uh, brings us to the end of the portraits, which it could arguably said, be said to have had some connection to Alexander during his lifetime, by which I mean uh, copies of works produced by official portraitists or by individuals who might well have known him, uh, either while Alexander was alive or at least relatively soon after his death. Uh, the fact that Alida Alexander died, <coughs> however, certainly did not bring uh, the production of portraits of him to an end. And in fact, if anything, it increases the demand for images of him. Uh, why this demand? There are lots of reasons. Uh, one of the main reasons being uh, the Hellenistic obsession with fortune, or Tuque. Uh, this idea that the gods, and particularly Tuque, the personification of fortune itself, were in control of human destiny. The gods ruled our lives. And in the unsettled political and social conditions of the Mediterranean world, following Alexander's death, where rulers and kingdoms rose and fell regularly, uh, Tuque could be perceived as here as a beneficent, protective goddess out for our, uh, the good of all, or she could be feared uh, as unpredictable and often capricious. So inhabitants of the Hellenistic world would spend a lot of time trying to think of ways to mitigate um, or avoid the sufferings that Tuque could cause. And this is partly why at the time mystery religions, the worship of goddesses like Isis, for example, gods who were somehow seen as being able to intervene or to circumvent uh, the vagaries of fate were so popular. It's also the heyday for magical charms, protective spells um, in the Hellenistic world. Another way, though, that you could guard against fate would be to associate yourselves with individuals with particularly personally strong spirits, or daimons, um, where they're seen as so strong uh, and favorable uh, that they were considered to be the equal of Tuque herself. So through association with these figures, some of the, their beneficent influence or basically their good luck could rub off on you. And not surprisingly, in terms of figures who were seen to have astonishingly good luck, Alexander topped the list um, of people favoured by good fortune, despite, of course, his untimely death, um, which people seem to forget about. But even when they were threatened by ill fortune, Alexander and those like him were able to overcome it and turn adversity into success. So thus, his image only increases in popularity, actually, in the decades and centuries uh, following his death. And this at least partly explains, I think, why we have the heroic exploits of Alexander Alexander being depicted in a house in Pompeii century after, centuries after Alexander's death. 
This sort of scene uh, would also have appealed to, uh, I think, contemporary taste for stories showing great reversals of fortune and the pathos that accompanied them. And it also explains, I think, why in the mosaic this, that's extensively there to celebrate Alexander's great victory, the main figure in it is Darius. So we're seeing, of course, the dramatic turn of events when everything favors the Persians, but suddenly, Fortune is reversed, and it's Alexander who comes out on top. His sort of unstoppable, irresistible good fortune keeps marching forward, whereas, of course, uh, Darius uh, flees in ignominy. So one reason why uh, portraits of Alexander are so popular uh, after his death. Uh, in addition to mosaics, we also get a number of very important posthumous portraits of Alexander. Um, what's interesting is how these images change over time. As memories, perhaps, of Alexander's exact physiognomy fade, uh, and he becomes more and more heroized, if you like. Uh, so here's a good example of that. This is. Um, Perhaps one of these, uh, a very good example of this transformation in these posthumous portraits. It's a marble head found in Macedonia, uh, Yanitsa, uh, near the Macedon Macedonian capital, Pala. Obviously, it's a Greek original produced under the Macedonian dynasty, um, which of course continues for around about 150 years after Alexander's death. Uh, it's dated to the end of the second century, so not in Alexander's lifetime, but, but when he's becoming the stuff of legends. So I think we can immediately recognize him, and we can also recognize those Lysippan characteristics uh, that we're familiar with, the, uh, the thin nose, the open mouth, but everything is just a little bit more exaggerated. The turn of the head is more pronounced, the gaze seems particularly uh, far off and otherworldly, as if he's occupied by uh, thoughts beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. The eyes are just slightly more deep set. There's a little bit more going on with the hair, a little bit more vibrant and leonine, if you like. Another good example of this trend uh, is the Pergamon Alexander from around about 180 BCE. Um, Made in Pergamon, Asia Minor, another of these successor kingdoms established after Alexander's death, and Pergamon is a city with a, uh, that possesses a very fine sculptural tradition that reaches its height in the second uh, century BCE, and this is really one of the best Pergamon works. So again, all of those characteristics of the Lysippan Alexander that we're familiar with, but again, just sort of with the dial turned up to 11, uh, as it were. So uh, deep furrows, though, uh, unlike Lysippus's Alexander, if we just if we just compare the two. So we have the suggestion of a few lines in the Lysippan Alexander here, much more deeply carved. Uh, so much more of a hint of his experiences, more careworn. Uh, this particular uh, sculpture is supposed to represent perhaps the, to capture the pothos, the heroic yearning uh, that is traditionally associated with Alexander. And I think it's certainly sufficiently different from the Lysippan original to categorically state it's not a copy uh, of Lysippus, rather it's a new creation. Um, which has more to do with the individual sculptor and the style of sculpture in Pergamon uh, at the time. It depicts Alexander as a powerful ruler, uh, but not as he was in his own lifetime, but rather perhaps we could say as a romantic hero, so that romantic element uh, coming into his portraits. As the same, at the same time as we get these heroized portraits, we also get the beginning of a, a second type of posthumous portrait that shows Alexander as a god. And this follows up, of course, on inclinations that he had in his own lifetime, particularly, of course, after the visit to the oracle at Siwa, where, as we all know, the conqueror was hailed by the chief priest as the son of the Egyptian god, Amon. So certainly this uh, starts a tendency to regard Alexander as a divinity, and this increases very much after his death, probably due to the fact that his ruler cult becomes increasingly established in the East, and Alexander is worshipped as a deity very much in the tradition of or other Oriental kings. So we get rep representations such as this, uh, a marble head in the British, mu uh, British Museum, where we've lost all sense of emotion uh, from his face. There's no longer the furrowed brow. He's got this rather much more dreamy expression as if his mind is on a different plane, perhaps uh, communing with the gods. Uh, a different type, we also get this uh, a very rare 
full, almost uh, full body statue uh, surviving that copies a second century BCE cult statue type. So this is very much, if you, were, if you didn't have a, a representation of Zeus enthroned, as we've already seen at Olympia, this is your typical cult statue type of Zeus, of Apollo, of Poseidon, the standing figure half draped, you have your hymation, your cloak wrapped around your uh, lower half of your body, leaving, of course, this wonderful heroically bare uh, torso. So in fact, when the statue was first discovered, it was identified as Apollo. Uh, so I think that we can see why that would be. But you'll just notice that he has the butt of his sword in his left hand, which of course Apollo would never hold, so identified very much, uh, I think, by most as Alexander now. Uh, in other Alexander portraits, we get uh, the illusion to divinity being made even clearer. Uh, this is a, a, a Alexander as uh, Helios, so the sun god at Helios. It looks like Alexander, with all of those Lysippan characteristics, again, just dialed up. What we can't see from this image is that around the top of his head, are uh, drilled holes that the rays of the sun god, the corona, would have poked out. And I'll just show you um, a very clumsy sort of, uh, the sort of thing. This is a, a, another uh, head that was sold at Christie's back in 2000 where they've rather crudely stuck these wooden things in. But anyway, you get a sense of the sort of the corona of, uh, of the sun god there as well. So one final uh, representation of Alexander as a god, Alexander as Zeus Kranofros, uh, a wall painting from the House of the Vetii, again at Pompeii. We've already seen the Alexander mosaic uh, from, Pei, from Pompeii. Alexander seems to have been extremely popular in Pompeii. We've got numerous images of him throughout the city um, for the reasons that we've already discussed, perhaps. Uh, this one, though, is important because it's probably based on an original. Remember we talked at the beginning, we've got Lysippus, the court sculptor. We've also got a Pallis, the court painter, and Apale's most famous work represented Alexander as uh, Zeus Korenophoros, so the holder of the thunderbolt. So he's got, you can see quite clearly, uh, the thunderbolt in his hand, seated and enthroned, holding the, um, uh, holding the spear. The sort of image, again, that we see from the cult statue of Zeus at Olympia, only in this case, of course, Zeus has his hand outstretched and his eagle. Uh, on it. So clearly close connections uh, between the two. So certainly uh, the idea of Alexander as a god uh, is something particularly emphasized by Alexander's generals, uh, those who become his so-called successors and who divide the lands of Alexander's empire into their kingdoms uh, after Alexander's death. So just as a reminder of how Alexander's empire is carved up amongst these diadochi, these successors. Uh, we've got the Antigonid dynasty up in Basigan, Lysimachus is in Thrace, uh, the Seleucids, of course, in Asia Minor uh, and much of the Near East, and the Ptolemies down here uh, in Egypt. So Alexander's empire is carved up after he died. And it's under the successes and their ears uh, that we find Alexander on coins for the very first time. Remember, Alexander never put his own face on his coins. So this, for example, is a nice, uh, a nice coin uh, minted under the Ptolemies around about 300 BCE. Uh, and you can see that uh, now, rather than... Uh, in the guise of Heracles, he has an elephant skin um, on his head uh, commemorating uh, battles uh, in the East. So it's not hard to understand why the successors uh, sought this connection with Alexander. By the time of Alexander's death, his image is synonymous with the iconography of power. Uh, and to associate yourself with his image is a way for perhaps other lesser mortals to stake their own claim to greatness. And this, this, not surprisingly, is particularly important in the wake of Alexander's death, when these powerful men are squabbling over his legacy and just who was entitled uh, to what in the breakup of the, uh, of the empire. So each success is casting himself as the legitimate heir uh, to Alexander. So here, posthumous depiction of Alexander as a youthful conqueror wearing the elephant skin, a reference to victories, as I said, over King Porus in 326 BCE. But now he's also got his divine attributes. Uh, he's, got the, he's wearing the aegis, 
the goat skin that only the gods wear uh, as a cloak. Uh, and he's got the horns, even though he's wearing his elephant helmet, he's also got the horns of the Greco-Egyptian deity uh, Zeus Amon, so the deity that, that Alexander claims as a father. Uh, another nice example from the successes, uh, a tetradram uh, minted by Lysimachus, Lysimachus uh, inherits the kingdom of Thrace in northern Greece. This is one of the finest, the first and finest of all of the posthumous portraits. Again, Alexander with the ram's horns uh, of Zeus Amon, you can see uh, here. So obviously Lysimachus invoking Alexander as a political ancestor and perhaps even as the patron deity uh, of his household. Another thing that you can do uh, to make your link to Alexander even more explicit if you're a successor is to adopt familiar Alexander-like characteristics in your own portraits, thereby enhancing your own status uh, and legitimacy. And a good example of this is Demetrius Polyorchites, uh, Demetrius the Besieger. Uh, so he's a member of the Antigonid family who inherits the king of Macedon after Alexander dies. He's also one of the first to utilize Alexander's image. So here we've got a Roman copy of the original uh, bust of uh, Demetrius. Uh, the, the original, we think, uh, was probably created by a student of Lysippus's son. So the work of Lysippus, uh, Lysippus's son, was virtually indistinguishable, we are told, from the work of the great master himself. So he's got his own sculptural school. And again, we can see all of those familiar Alexander characteristics, the turn of the head, the deep-set eyes, the slightly open mouth, uh, etc. He also wore a diadem in imitation of Alexander, tousled here like Alexander, no anastole though, but he doesn't have the ram's horns of Alexander. I hope that maybe you can just make those out. Rather, he's got the two bull's horns of the god Poseidon Toreos, so Poseidon the bull god of the sea, and this is the god from whom Demetrius claims descent. So he's adopting Alexander's image type, but he's adapting it uh, to suit his own needs and circumstances as well. And he also utilizes the same image on his coinage. So again, with the, uh, as you can see, sort of the horns of Poseidon Torres, and just to emphasize the connection to, to Poseidon rather than Zeus on the back of the coin, there is his, the god from whom he claims descent, Poseidon, on the reverse of his coins. So uh, you can see from the coin portrait, Again, the, the familiar features of Alexander, but with just enough individualizing physiognomy to identify him as a different individual, but with kind of, again, this Alexander veneer uh, over the top. Uh, one of the most famous representations uh, of portraits from the Hellenistic world based on this kind of Alexander type uh, is that of Atlas I uh, from Pergamon. Remember, we've already mentioned Pergamon, uh, home to one of the greatest sculptural schools in the ancient world. Not surprising when we get sculptures of incredible uh, quality like this one. Uh, it's the same workshop that around about the same time produced this portrait of Alexander. And in fact, the two may well have been displ displayed uh, side by side in the city's heroon, a shrine to the city's uh, heroes. Uh, so uh, the hair, if you can see, uh, of Atlas, very much kind of in the same mold of the Alexander type, deeply cut, uh, like, uh, which is very typical of the Pergamene sculptural school at the time. Um, in fact, we can tell, it's difficult to tell from this slide, but the, the sculptor's first attempt at representing this, this wonderful leonine massive here was clearly not good enough, and they end up adding like a toupee on the top, so there are two levels of hair here just to really make sure that it looks nice and, uh, nice and full and Alexander-like. So similar features, but with enough clearly to show you that this is a different individual. It's Atlas, not uh, Alexander. So let me just skip ahead in time for one final Hellenistic sculpture. You've probably seen more than you need. Um, this is Mithridates VI, Eupater, uh, one of the last Hellenistic kings to hold out against an ever-expanding Roman Empire. Uh, he's heralded by many as the liberator of Asia Minor, just as Alexander had been 250 years before him. And he's clearly utilizing this, the familiar Alexander type to emphasize this idea that Mithridates is a new Alexander. Uh, so here we've got a marble bust of him. He's wearing, of course, the familiar lion skin of Alexander Heracles. Uh, 
Perhaps only the long sideburns and slightly uh, different profile indicate that this isn't actually a, a posthumous portrait of Alexander himself. But I think it says something about the power and the span of Alexander's image that it's not just the Hellenized Greeks like uh, Mithridates who are maintaining and promoting uh, iconographic links to Alexander. The Romans, his enemies, are doing it as well. So everybody's in on the action. Um, so clearly Alexander's character is so much larger than life that his de and his deeds are so legendary uh, that he finds a place in the imagination of many different uh, cultures. And in Rome, though, it has to be said, Alexander is a little bit problematic in some ways, particularly during the Republic, where this concept of a king is an anathema. The, the early Romans, of course, after the expulsion of the Etruscan kings, are Republicans. Uh, having said, and Livy, for example, the Roman historian, is clearly not a fan of his despotism. He considers Alexander to be corrupted by Eastern luxury. But despite this, it's quite common for Roman rulers to identify themselves with Alexander, and particularly with his aura of invincibility. And certainly, Alexander is held up as a role model for Roman generals who attempt to surpass uh, his military achievements. And I'll just show you an artist's rendering of perhaps the most famous example of this. Uh, we see Julius Caesar, of course, another very famous uh, general here, standing in front of a statue of Alexander the Great. And according to Caesar's uh, biographer Suetonius, while he was in Spain, a young Julius Caesar is said to have visited the Temple of Hercules within which was a statue of Alexander. And Caesar stands before the statue of Alexander and he laments or he sighs or he cries, however you translate it. Uh, and when he's asked by his companions why he's doing this, he tells them that at his age, the age of 33, Alexander had conquered the world while he himself had done nothing at all that was memorable. So from an early age, Caesar comparing himself uh, to Alexander. And in fact, Plutarch tells a similar story which, where Caesar bursts into tears when he's reading a history of Alexander the Great. One can't help but think uh, that it's at least partly to annoy Caesar that Caesar's greatest rival and foe, Pompey, deliberately associates himself also with Alexander to the point where Pompey uh, adopts the same epithet, Pompey Magnus, Pompey the Great. Uh, like Alexander, Pompey is a general who campaigns in the East, and the sources tell us that he cultivated what he thought was a personal resemblance to Alexander. I'll lead you to judge the levels of his delusion um, for yourselves. But okay, the similar Alexander features the tousled here, maybe the slight suggestion of an anastole uh, going on here, the furrowed brow, very similar to the, the pergamine type of Alexander that we've already seen. Clearly not Alexander, though. The sort of much rounder, fleshier face, thin lips, firmly closed mouth, and we see him, of course, frontally rather than with that characteristic turn of the head. So maybe we could call this a hybrid uh, portrait where we're blending heroic features of Alexander with historical realism uh, as well. So intended to suggest to the viewer that the subject here is imbued with the same heroic qualities uh, as Alexander, but at the same time is recognizable as a distinctly different individual. Uh, once we get into the imperial period, uh, there are many emperors who cultivate uh, a connection to Alexander. Sometimes it's overt, sometimes it's much more subtle. Uh, this is uh, the most famous statue, of course, of Rome's first emperor, uh, the Emperor Augustus. Maybe we could argue, argue for certain physical similarities here. Um, certainly follows the ideal that Alexander embodied, youthful, clean-shaven, aquiline features. Um, like Alexander, Augustus doesn't change at all over time, but unlike Alexander, Augustus lives a very long life. He dies at 76, where the written sources tell us um, that he had decayed teeth, a body marred by blemishes and ringworm, his but yet his portraits still look youthful and vigorous, uh, as is, we see quite clearly here in his most famous portrait statue, the Prima Porta Augustus. The hair is more subdued, no anastole, but he develops his own affectation at the front of his head with these crab claw locks that his whole dynasty then uh, adopts. So clearly, I think the same sort of idea as Alexander's portraits um, here. So uh, Augustus is certainly canny enough to distance himself from the more, shall we say, despotic aspects of Alexander's character and ambitions. But nevertheless, Augustus and his family 
did display images and artifacts uh, associated with Alexander, but in a subtle way. So for example, we're told that um, Augustus wore uh, a seal ring with Alexander's image on it. So that's a very personal um, uh, thing that he would keep. Uh, we know that he also displayed uh, two paintings by Apelles, originals by Apelles, of Alexander as conqueror in the Forum Augustum, this magnificent piazza with the Temple of Mars, Altar Mars, the Avenger, that Augustus builds in the center of Rome. Uh, we know that he also puts a painting of Philip and uh, Alexander on display in the portico, uh, the portico uh, Oct Porticus Octavii, which he builds as well. Uh, we know also that Augustus particularly uh, employs uh, imagery of Alexander after he defeats Antony and Cleopatra. So at this point, he's really conveying the message that like Alexander, Augustus is now firmly in control uh, of the East. And in fact, we know that when he was in Egypt, um, Augustus asks to visit Alexander's uh, tomb. And so this is a, obviously a, a later 17th century French painting uh, imagining what this would have looked like. But he orders the coffin to be removed from the tomb and he adorns Alexander's head with a gold wreath and he fills the coffin with flowers uh, to show his admiration. Uh, so a lovely story there. Uh, Arthur Augustus, uh, there are many emperors uh, who admired uh, Alexander that we could talk about, uh, none more so, just one example, uh, than Caracalla. Uh, like Pompey, Caracalla assumes the epithet Magnus the Great. Um, he's also said to have adopted the clothing, the weapons, the behaviour of Alexander, even though, interestingly, he's, after Hadrian, he's one of the emperors that represents himself bearded. You would think that he would shave, but anyway, he doesn't do that. But he, nevertheless, he adopts the clothing, the weapons, the behaviour of Alexander. Uh, he even follows Alexander's travel routes. He visits Alexandra while, Alexandria while preparing for his own invasion of the East. He allegedly plans to conquer the Parthian Empire in imitation of Alexander. Uh, and according to Dio Cassius, the historian, he has his troops arranged in a Macedonian-style phalanx despite the fact that the Roman army had clearly um, made the phalanx an obsolete uh, tactical formation by this stage. So taking it to extremes, perhaps. Uh, he also represents himself very much in the mode of Alexander on... Uh, uh, on things like these, got the gold medallion that you see here. Um, you can see that, well, he here, it's a little bit difficult to make out, but he's carrying a shield with the image of Alexander on it. On the reverse uh, of the gold medallion, Basilius Alexandros, so King Alexander, hammering that point home. And here, a shield representing Achilles, the, Greek, the greatest Greek hero, of course, Achilles, killing Penthesilea, which is quite clearly a scene that's very closely associated with the Macedonian dynasty. We have almost an identical shield in gold and ivory surviving from Philip II's tomb, representing Achilles killing the Amazon Penthesilea, which of course the Romans wouldn't have known about. It was, it was in Philip's tomb at the time, but clearly the scene is uh, closely associated with Alexander uh, and his family. Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm sure that I've gone over time. I'll just, I'll finish our survey uh, of uh, Alexander representations from Greece and Rome there. This hasn't left us much time for what follows, my apologies. But suffice to say, um, the end of antiquity is very far from the end uh, of the world's fascination with Alexander the Great. On the contrary, uh, the legend of Alexander has incredible power and longevity. Over two millennia after Alexander's um, death stories of his life and his accomplishments are widely disseminated. And as time passes, historical fact becomes less and less important in favor of fabulous uh, material. And in particular, uh, we get the evolution of what's known as the Alexander Romance. So various versions of these fabulous stories that cover the entirety of Alexander's life. Uh, the earliest versions that we get are in the third century CE and are attributed to a writer uh, known as pseudo Callisthenes. Gradually, these stories, though, transform from the 4th to the 16th centuries, and we get multitudes of versions. So we've get, we get versions in Greek, and Latin, and Persian, and Armenian, and Hebrew, and Old French, and Middle English, and in German, endless uh, 
renditions of these stories. Basically, what I'm saying is that each age makes Alexander its own. So, for example, in the European Middle Ages, uh, Alexander becomes the exemplum of the chivalrous knight, the defender of Christendom, if you could believe it, whose adventures would be recited at private and public gatherings throughout the medieval period. So here you've got uh, Alexander slaying the dragon in this wonderful 12th century manuscript, very much in the tradition of Christian heroes and saints. But what's nice is that he also becomes, in the Middle Ages, a discoverer and an inventor. Um, and of course, this has its origins in the fact that uh, Alexander was uh, Aristotle's pupil. And we know that Alexander took a great interest in the natural world. He had scientists, geographers, botanists accompanying him on his campaigns through the East. So the romance builds on this uh, and has Alexander undertaking all sorts of crazy adventures uh, in the name of exploration. This is one of my favorites. There are many we could look at. So Alexander in the, in the glass bathosphere. Um, so Alexander is bored. What happens when you're bored of conquering the world? You become curious about other things. And he wants to learn the truth of the sea. And so he asks his glass masters to construct a glass barrel, a bathosphere, a glass bubble, basically. So here he is dressed very much as a nice medieval Christian king here at the bottom of the ocean uh, in the glass diving bell. Uh, and in fact, in various versions of the story, uh, he gets abducted by a fish, which I think probably is what's happening here, this wonderful fish. I mean, just look at the details in this work. Great fish, some sort of aquatic humans, as you get aquatic dogs and aquatic rams down here as well. It's, it's just absolutely magnificent. And there are so many versions. This is a particularly favorite one, I think, for the manuscript illustrators of this representation of Alexander going down uh, to the bottom of the ocean. And wonderful details. So for example, he takes animals with him. He takes a rooster, a cat, and a dog down in his submarine, his bath sphere, with him. The idea being that the rooster's crowing down at the bottom of the ocean will tell him when it's daytime. If you can't tell the difference between day and night, the rooster will crow and you'll be able to keep track of time. The cat's breath, it was thought, would purify the air in the glass bell. And most importantly, the dog he could kill. So you're looking at the, the cat, the dog, and the rooster in this one. Um, if anything happened and went wrong, he would kill the dog, and it was widely known that the sea always spits up bodies of dead things. So if he kills the dog, then the dog will get washed up on shore, and Alexander will get washed up with him. This is the um, uh, this is the theory, but really nice details here and some slight differences. You can see in this example and in this example, there's a woman in the boat. So this is Alexander's wife or perhaps his mistress. And her important job, as you can see here, she's doing her job well, is to hold the rope or the chain that connects the diving bell so he can get pulled up. You might notice on the right hand side, the chain is at the bottom of the ocean. Alexander is not looking at all happy, looking up at his wife absconding with her lover. So she's chucked the chain overboard and he's left at the bottom of the ocean. So this is the point at which you kill the dog and hope that you get washed up um, on shore. I love, look at the face on that fish. That is so, that's just fabulous. Uh, anyway, so having explored the depths of the ocean then, Alexander decides uh, to explore the heavens. And so a companion adventure is that he harnesses either carnivorous birds or griffins in this case uh, to his chariot. He starves them for three days and then he puts a horse's liver on top of a pole, and as they try and reach the liver, they all fly up and he ascends uh, to, to the heavens. Uh, at which point an angel appears to him and points out that his actions are not that of a modest Christian, so he returns down to earth. But in typical Alexander fashion, he lands far, far away from his takeoff point and then has to travel home for months, having all sorts of adventures on the way um, as well. So wonderful. And it's not just in manuscripts that we get these stories told. Here is uh, architectural decoration uh, from San Marco, an 11th century relief in Venice, originally taken from Constantinople, where you can see uh, Alexander's ascent to heaven as well.
Uh, perhaps Alexander's most extraordinary transformation, though, comes in Persian tradition. So think about it. After being a figure of hatred to Persians and later Iranians, he is the conqueror. He is the, the destroyer of Persepolis. He burned the great palace of Persepolis, which is this, uh, you know, the, the greatest sacrilege that they could imagine. In Islamic tradition, Alexander actually becomes the secret son of the Persian king Darius the Great, not of Philip of Macedon at all. And there's a long story, as you can imagine, behind all this that involves uh, Darius traveling secretly to Macedon and seducing Olympias. Alexander then ends up being his son, etc. An extraordinary rewriting of history in which the figure of Alexander is orientalized to become Iskandar, the, an Eastern prophet, a, a, a hero, a wise man. And he actually appears in the Quran as the Lord of the Twin Horns, Dola Quran, um, the Lord of the Twin Horns. And this is probably uh, due to the fact that in coins, uh, coins and effigies like this one were circulating in the, East, uh, in the East for thousands of years after Alexander's death. And the horns of Zeus Amon that we're familiar with are taken to represent the twin horizons of the east and the west. So in the Quran, the Lord of the Twin Horns travels to the ends of the world. Uh, he sees the sun set in a muddy spring in the west. He travels to the very eastern ends of the earth uh, where he sees the sun rise uh, from the ocean. Uh, he also travels to the far north. Uh, where he erects a legendary wall um, known as uh, the Gates of Alexander or the Caspian Gates uh, to keep the tribes of uncivilized barbarians uh, out uh, from the civilized peoples of the world. In fact, he's just supervising while a series of gen or demons or genies down here are actually building the wall uh, for him. Uh, we also get some scenes that you'll recognize straight out of the Alexander Romance, or the Western versions of it. Again, Alexander in his, in his bathosphere being uh, dropped down uh, to the bottom of the ocean. Now, though, see that he's a, a, a turbaned king. Some of his companions still look kind of Western-looking, almost like the Renaissance courtiers here, but most of his followers are uh, resembling sort of Muslim uh, sages. Uh, we also have slightly less heroic activities. Here he is spying on sirens as they bathe in a lake. And then I'll leave you with just one final uh, image, which I think sort of sums up um, the importance of Alexander in these Eastern traditions. A late 15th century manuscript uh, showing us a dreamlike garden paradise in which the ghosts of the, uh, of the greatest Persian poets are all gathered in this wonderful garden. And they're actually welcoming a new poet into their ranks. And you can see that his hands are hidden in the sleeves of his garment, which is a sign of, of respect uh, and modesty. So why are all of these poets gathered in this dreamlike garden? What do they have in common? The common link is that they've all made contributions to the Islamic romance of Alexander the Great. And I think that gives you an indication of the extraordinary importance of Alexander in high Islamic uh, civilization. So I'm sorry, um, our time is, is more than up here. There are so many other representations we could um, look at. Um, all of that is a lecture for another day. But for now, I think we can safely conclude that the plethora, uh, that in the plethora of heroes and conquerors known to us from antiquity, I think none could claim uh, to lay claim to an image that was as diverse, as influential, or as long-standing uh, as that of Alexander. Thank you. Any questions? I'm just going to ask, what point did the Romans uh, begin to admire Alexander and begin to kind of replicate his image towards Alexander? Well, as I said... So the question was, at what point did the Romans start to admire Alexander? And really, as I was saying, I think the first indications, significant indications we get of it are really at the beginning of the empire. So, um, at, well, at the, in the late Republic, we get Caesar and Pompey, uh, and then 
picking up with the emperors. And of course, the reason for that is that, I mean, he's, as I say, he's not a popular character so much during the Republic, where, I mean, in 509, of course, 509 BCE, Rome expels its last Etruscan king. So the idea very much then is that Rome is governed by a Republic. And the idea of a single powerful man with a powerful army behind him ruling the city is, is a very unpopular notion. So it's in the late Republic, particularly in the first century BC, uh, with generals like Marius and Sulla, but then ending very much with Caesar and Pompey, where that that perception starts to change and we get the rise of what's called the preeminent general. So Rome starts to fall under the sway of individuals who have great personal, political power, great wealth, and a great army behind them as well. So it's at that point, I would say first century BC, but certainly once you get into the empire, it becomes more and more pronounced, this affiliation with Alexander, yeah. Thanks for the uh, talk, Dr. Bell, it was fantastic. I've got two questions. One quick one is, uh, have you heard anything about the Amphipoli tomb? Have you heard yes, much I'm, about what's come out of there? Has it been, I'm uh, familiar with it. I, I haven't kept up to date sort of in the past sort of year or so, but I'm familiar with the tomb, which is just absolutely extraordinary. And the arguments for whether it's Olympias's tomb, I don't have too much of an opinion okay. on that, but uh, and carry the, on, The please. second question was um, in Bactria, there was a, a relief of... Uh, Alexander looking like a demigod next to Siddhartha Gautama with the Buddha. Right. Um, is it true that that was the first meaning of East and Western influence in sculpture and they took that back to China? I couldn't say definitively. Um, as I say, I'm no massive expert on these uh, on these things, so I would hate to say f for sure, but certainly it's during the reign of Alexander where we get the East and the West meeting to it to a degree that they never have before. So something like that wouldn't surprise me, but I can't comment on that specific Thanks word. Very much. Sorry, I, I apologize. Why do you think that it is that um, during the Mary medieval period, Alexander became pictured as a Christian warrior? I think because, of course, in the, medie the, the medieval period is the great period of the chivalrous knight. So, you know, the, the, the heroic knight who fights valiantly on behalf of the good. Uh, and, you know, Alexander, I suppose, uh, and the reputation that he brings with him as this extremely skilled general who defeats the odds. And remember, going back to that idea that he's favoured by fortune and good luck. So in a Christian tradition, you could, you know, you could translate the bit to being favoured by God as well. Anybody who is so successful surely must be favoured by God. Uh, so the idea that he fights on behalf of the good, and remember that Alexander's campaign is very much waged as a campaign um, to right a wrong. So the Persians had invaded Greece. They had sacked the, the Athenian Acropolis, which was, of course, the height of, uh, you know, of sacrilege at the time. He is moving to the east to right a wrong in a kind of the sort of crusade, if you like, not such a great word, um, that a knight would undertake in the Middle Ages as well. And perhaps to, to the same degree, this idea of the West versus the East as well. In antiquity, Greece and their foes, the Persians, as of course we see in the Middle Ages with the idea of crusade, the knights moving to the East uh, as well. So maybe they found a sort of a resonance between those things there. Well, thank you for a most fascinating talk. Um, I wanted to comment and ask about the sculptures uh, showing Alexander in thought. Um, other uh, documentaries I've seen um, indicate that he was someone that planned his battles and planned his battles, and that was rare for uh, things like like that at the time. Mm -hmm. um, would you say that the sculptors wanted to depict that side that um, he wanted 
as someone who was a right. thinker the rather than yeah the thoughtful thinker. intellectual side no i think you're absolutely i think you're absolutely right uh, the fact that in in all of his battles and i'm no i'm certainly no military historian but in all of his battles alexander is in charge of by far the more inferior numerically force of men so he is winning these battles against what would seem to be to the you know to the average observer insurmountable odds insurmountable numerical odds and his tactical genius is well known you know even from his earliest days as a teenager sort of in charge of a flank of cavalry under his father uh, Philip of Macedon when they go to battle so his genius as a military thinker is well known from you know from the the earliest points so i think I can't help but think, and certainly in some of those images where he is sort of gazing off into the distance, we are supposed to get more of a sense, but art is open to interpretation, so you know, I, I could be no more right than anybody else. But I think the fact that we, we see him gazing upwards and we know what we know of Alexander's character, particularly from the historians who talk about his plans as he's you know, just before his death, you know, the grandiose plans that he may or may not have had. Um, I would say if I had to toss up between the two, whether he's gazing up thinking of military strategies or he's thinking of sort of greater, more heroic plans of a heroic strategy, I think probably that's what they're trying to convey. But certainly the fact that, uh, you know, that he is an intellectual and that, that reason and logic are extremely important to him are absolutely true to character. And if they come across in the sculptures, then that, then that is entirely fitting as well, I think. Uh, I'd like to um, congratulate you for the absolutely fascinating Thank lecture. Thank you. Um, it was mesmerizing. Thank you. Um, there's two things I wanted to ask. Um, you didn't mention anything about his death. Right. So I'd like you to comment on that. And okay. two, I'd like you to sincerely tell me what you think of him. <laughs> What's your opinion of him? Oh, okay. Well, uh, all right. Well, his death, of course, he dies in Babylon in 323, as we all know. I can, I can speak with at least one interesting fact here because, I mean, we don't know how he died. So the historians who are describing his condition to us centuries after he actually dies talk about um, fevers, uh, and uh, a paralysis that besets him. So scholars have thought, well, I don't know, is it, is it malaria? Is it alcoholism? Because, of course, we get accounts from, admittedly, some of the more sensationalist historians of just how much Alexander is drinking in the final years of his life. So is he coming to some sort of alcoholic poisoning? Is he just poisoned, straight out poisoned? Because there are a lot of people, quite clearly, angling to, you know, to, to inherit a lot from Alexander and also wanting to just go home, whereas Alexander is wanting to keep on, to keep on going. But I don't know whether what's prompting your question is a recent theory that has come out of New Zealand. Are you familiar with this at all? There's, there's a scholar at the medical school at the University of Otago in New Zealand, um, who has come up with a new suggestion. So the sources talk about all of these symptoms. Importantly is the paralysis and also abdominal pain um, that she thinks uh, combine to suggest a disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome. So it's actually, yes, am I pronouncing it? Um, yeah, it's yes, so in fact, one of the symptoms of which is paralysis to the point where it's it's a campylobacter infection i think something viral something something like that um so one of the symptoms of which would be paralysis so she has actually suggested that when in fact they thought alexander was dead he was in fact just paralyzed to the point where he's lacking he's needing so little oxygen that he's he's barely even appearing to breathe and so this is this just came out this year this this new suggestion of how he actually might have died and it makes a lot of sense of all of the symptoms and i think whether it's true or not i don't know it's an interesting possibility to consider but what it also i think demonstrates to us that that you know 2500 years after his death 2400 years after his death the way that he still captures our imagination and we still want to know even though we'll probably have, we'll never know for sure what actually killed him but 
but we're still desperate to find out. So similar thing with his tomb as well. Will that ever be found? I don't, I don't know. Sorry, what was your second? What is your sincere opinion? Oh, what is my sincere opinion of him? Well, I'm not in the Badian school of thought where he's a, 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 a megalomaniac um, by any stretch of the imagination. I think he is a man who, uh, of immense gift and immense talent, um, who the further he travels into the East, and the further he becomes subject to Eastern influences, perhaps, and the idea, if he's greeted by uh, by a, the priest of an oracle as a god, and as he moves further east into uh, into territories where it's very very commonplace for kings to be sh to be worshipped as living gods, then he is a man who who I think is influenced by his not just his time, but his own personal experience as well. I'm, I'm hedging, as you can see, around, around the question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah he, is, he was is, um, a military genius, and um, yeah, I, I have admiration for him. <laughs> Thank you. Was that diplomatic? I don't know.